technical director for the New England Revolution, about to enter his second year with the Revolution, Kurt Anolfo. He has significant playing experience at the, some of the, at the one of the best colleges in the country. Good playing experience through the beginning of the MLS, and then since then he's turned his skills over to the coaching side of the game, in which he's been both a head coach and an assistant coach and now a technical director for the New England Revolution. So without further ado, I'd like everybody to welcome Kurt Anolfo. Thank you very much, and, and, and thank you very much for having me. Um, I guess there's, I won't be able to see everybody else, can I? Can I see the, let me see if I can, no. It's not like Zoom where you can see everybody's faces? Uh, not everybody, you could probably okay. see a handful of them. Um, so, I, I, first of all, I'm, I'm really happy to be here um, to, to spend, you know, however long we'll spend tonight uh, talking about the game that we love. Um, I, I'm actually, uh, I'm from New England. I grew up in uh, Ridgefield, Connecticut. Uh, I was actually a product of the ODP system. Um, and I played for Ridgefield uh Soccer, uh, uh, Richfield Soccer Club, we, we called it SCORE. SCORE, I, I worked my way all the way through the, that whole system, played for the state team in Connecticut, played for our regional team, played for um, our youth national teams, played, played in the Olympics. Uh, and this is, um, this is really my home. In the, for the, uh, when I was a little older, when I was 24 years old, I was actually diagnosed with cancer, and believe it or not, during that, I, I was I was somebody that was pegged to potentially make the 1994 World Cup team, but because I was sick, I actually Sunil Gulati was, you know, very popular in this part of the uh, country. I actually walked the uh, World Cup trophy into the stadium, the old Foxborough Stadium. So this is for me. This is somewhat a little bit of a homecoming uh, to be with New England. I, I'm very happy to be what I feel like as home. Um, you know, I'm the technical director of the New England Revolution, and uh, that that title means a lot of different things. I've, you know, ever since I retired from playing professional soccer, I've I've been a, a coach, and and this is my first role uh, where I'm in, really in management and uh, kind of overseeing the soccer side of the organization. Uh, obviously. Bruce Arena is our is our sporting director and our head coach, and he is uh, amazing at what he does. Uh, he's a strong leader, has very very strong beliefs, and um, he obviously is the decision maker with with all of our all of our big decisions, uh, especially when it comes to the first team. Uh, I'm also you know I I do whatever I can to help him uh, to be successful and hopefully take some things off his plate so that he can coach and continue to do the things that he does great. But I'm also in, responsible for the developmental system of the New England Revolution. So that's basically bridging the gap from the academy to the first team. We just started uh, the Revolution uh, 2. Unfortunately, we, you know, because of the COVID situation, we haven't played our inaugural game yet, but we have those players training and that's something that was really integral to our developmental plan and we feel like that's going to really help accelerate the development of our top players. I'm very passionate about that part of it. I'm passionate about all parts of soccer, but that part I really love. I, w I was the uh, um, the coach of LA Galaxy 2 for many years, and we were the first uh, team at that time in MLS to pioneer and launch that. And it was a really gratifying period of time in my coaching career because I was able to help college-age kids uh, give them, you know, help them give give them the the tools to be successful uh, in in the career that they love, and in the same time feed players to Bruce with the first team. So that was something that I really enjoyed, and we're gonna we're gonna try to do the same thing here in New England. Uh, we feel like we're off to a pretty good start. We we have a we have a solid academy. We got to continue to make better. Um, so that that's in a nutshell kind of what my role is. I have other responsibilities. You know, we have a um, you know, performance department, uh, we have team operations, we have, you know, obviously the second team academy, we have a scouting department, analytics department. I help kind of o oversee those and the directors in each one of the, those. 
Um, but my main focus is our developmental system and then helping the first team in any way I possibly can. So, so can I can I interject for a minute and just give a reminder to everybody on the call that if they do have a question for you to feel free to type it into the chat box. Sure. And then we could share it. We could share it with you and hopefully answer their questions as well. Okay. Absolutely. That and well, I think that's the perfect time to go ahead and do that because I don't want to talk about me the whole time here. I, I've, I've talked enough. Let's, I would love to uh, hear those questions and, and, we'll, and we'll go from there. Uh, if I could start with a question and that will give some people some time to type their questions into the chat box, but um, you're beginning to work with the youth players and obviously you came up through soccer with the, with the, um, at a time when soccer wasn't quite the same as it is now. But if you had to think about young kids like U12 age group, U10 age group, would you consider any kind of important drills, if you want to call it that, that you would encourage coaches to try to keep the kids engaged with? I mean, you know, the, 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 the thing, the way I look at youth soccer is, first of all, the younger the kids are, I think it, the harder it is to coach them because they just have so much energy. Um, you know, I, I also do think it's a privilege to be uh, coaching and, and coaching kids. For me, the, the, you know, it obviously just depends on obviously the level in some cases, but the most important thing is that the kids are always having fun and they're touching a ball and that uh, you, you're trying to be creative in those type of things so that they're, 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 you know, killing two birds with one stone because the kids have to get touches on the ball. That's the only way um, for them to improve and to kind of get that love for the game. I, I used to, uh, you know, I, in my youth soccer experience, I used to do a, a circuit where I had like a, a juggling station or if the kids were, if that was too difficult, I'd have a little, you know, you do the bell, you know, inside, outside, that kind of things. You dribble through the cones, you get the, and it was a circuit that would get a thousand touches in about 20 minutes. And I would always ask the players um, at the end of that, I'd be like, I said, I would say, you know, do you feel more comfortable on the ball uh, now than you did 20 minutes ago? And they all said, yes. And the thing is, if you keep doing that, that's when you start really developing the love for the game because you start getting good at it and you start getting that positive reinforcement. So. I would just say that you know, not I don't have specific drills that I would 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 bring up right now, but I just think if you you got to maximize touches on the ball, so doing things where it, a, a lot of drills where they're getting touches, because that's that's going to help them uh, feel better on the ball and enjoy the game more. Thank you for that. Next one is out of if you think about dribbling, passing, and shooting, which is probably the three common that most people know in the game of soccer. When you talk about the younger players, is there any one of those that you would say the, there should be an emphasis on mastering at a at a younger age? Well, you, 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 I would say de I would I would definitely say dribbling because that's a big part of it in the beginning in the beginning stages. Uh, you need all those skills, unfortunately. I mean, you, you have to be able to pass too as you get older. And I have a I like I always was a, have a pet peeve about like shooting, like I want players to know how to lock their ankle. So I, I actually have a funny story with that because I, you know, I was a director of a soccer club and um, I would just always go around to my coaches and I was like, they have to know how to lock their ankle. If your player doesn't know how to lock their ankle, I'm gonna, I'm, you're gonna have an issue with me. I, that's at a minimum, I want them to know how to shoot because scoring is like the best part of the game. And, you know, so it was always a big emphasis for me. Like I had a Portuguese coach that that taught me that at an early age, and here here I remember. So with my own son at the time, he was he was I don't know eight years old. He couldn't lock his ankle. It was driving me crazy, you know. And this is my own son. So I came up with this thing called the shoelace challenge, so that you could you would teach teach the player to get to point his toe down and 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 strike a ball that way. Um, so uh, you know, I think I think one at a young age you got to be able to dribble, and then I would go shooting next, and then the last part passing because as you get older, that obviously becomes more important. So how did how did your son take to the challenge? He he did. I actually taught him how to lock his ankle at the bus stop. 
literally while we're <laughs> waiting for the bus. I'm like, yes, finally, we got it. So that's what my bus stop used to look like. Also, there's always a game of something going on while we were waiting yeah. for the for the bus to come. Yeah. So. Again, for anyone who has a question for Kurt, please feel free to type it into the chat box. Um, and he's more than willing to answer all of them. We have one that just came in. Yeah. Thank I you so much it. for taking the time to chat with us. I'm a soccer parent and coach in Waltham. I want to ask you about the Revs Academy program. I'm wondering why the Revs don't field teams before the U14 question. age group. Really, really good question. And, you know, really, what it does is when you start, when, when you start identifying players at a really young age, you're, you're, you're making the pool smaller and kids develop at different rates. So for us, we want to have influence with, you know, our, our partners and, and the other, other clubs that are in the area that are, that are uh, developing these players at the younger age groups. But for us, um, we're, we will have a U14 team, a U15 team, a U17 team, a U19 team, and our second team, which is really, in essence, U23. So all, what that does, um, and, uh, and a lot of the MLS teams are going to be moving away from having them at, at such a younger age, it just gives them more opportunity to have fun, it, for, to be less... Uh, you know, less pressure on the kids at, an, at a young age, which sometimes turns to burnout and they leave, you know, um, where you can, you know, there's, there's a lot of good people in this country that know how to uh, teach kids soccer. There's, a, a, you know, a lot of people that have played the game and they're back in the game. And so what it does, it just enables that pool to get bigger. And then so, the, you know, at, at the uh, U14 age is when we start corralling them up. So you made a follow-up to that. You made the comment that most of the other teams are going to be following suit with that eliminating the 12 and 13 programs. Is that a, a league recommendation or is that just the, the club's I philosophy? think there's a lot of things. You know, there's, there's uh, you know, some of the things I alluded upon. I also think economics comes into it because it's fully funded. And, you, you know, you, it's, uh, you know, it's expensive. You know, so the more teams you have and you think about the travel that that these elite players are doing it, it adds up. So I, I think that has something to do with it. But I think more than anything, it's just it's it's the uh, creating a bigger pool of players that are enjoying the game. And, and you know, it's less travel. It's it's just it, it's just more manageable for the for the for the kids as they develop. Thank you for that. Um, a question that popped up was about. Uh, and it goes back to what you had said in the introduction about you try to release some of the pressures from Bruce um, so that he could do what he does best. For the Revs on, on game day, what's your what's your role when uh, you come to the facility? Well, so so I've been here one year. We came in we came in halfway through the season, and then when I first came to the Revs, I actually was on the field helping. Uh, I was coaching because. We didn't have our staff fully in place, but once we got our fast, our, our staff fully in place, our technical staff, I I uh, I am now not on the field on a, on a daily basis coaching. Um, uh, so on, on game day, uh, I, I, my, my role is um, it's a it's a different type of role. I'm observing. I'm you know I'm I'm watching the game, making my assessments that type of stuff, but that's Bruce and his technical staff that are uh, uh, doing the coaching on the, on the, on the, on game day. Thank you. There's you often like on a game day, for example, if it's at home and our academy is played, I've watched all of our academy uh, teams play, played if it's a local area or if our second team is played, I would, will have done that as well. So it's a, it's a lot of observing uh, and in the developmental part, it's just making sure our, you know, our style of play and, and the way we do things are being in, in implemented the way uh, our organization wants. So you have a lot of uh, collecting data to share with Bruce and just kind of- I mean, listen, Bruce is, I mean, the, the honest truth is Bruce, Bruce has uh, got enormous experience. If he wants to ask me my opinion, he'll ask my opinion. I'm not gonna just offer it with, uh, Without him asking for it, he's he knows what he's doing and and he's great at what he does. Um, 
but you know, um, he's we're we're very lucky to have him here. Yes, we are. Um, a question came in from Dan Rudolph, and he he was talking about your comments that you made about getting loads of touches with drills and circuit type activities. How much do games and scrimmages also factor into? Huge, huge part. Small sided games are huge. I always say, you know, the day that you just had one of those really difficult days where you just, I mean, you know, we all have had them where you just can't get to your lesson plan and you show up to the field. I mean, it happens. It's okay. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're humans. And, you know, obviously planning is always a good part of, of helping players, you know, progress. But there's nothing wrong with, you know, letting the kids warm up, breaking them up, letting them play a mini World Cup in a small side environment. That's getting touches on the ball, you know, getting the ball back in play quickly so they're getting more touches so you're not stopping, you know, like, I, you know, with the, with the young players, it, ball goes out, put another one in, let them play, let them get the touches. And they, you know, and they, they especially at the young ages, they, they, they're able to um, go for a long period of time. And when they're tired, they kind of just stop, you know. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people just use drills as a generic statement but it sounds like most of what you're doing with the youth players is game like activities yeah you try to make it game like but they they have to have fun they need to be enthusiasm and they don't you know they don't want to run laps they don't want to be lectured they don't want to be standing in line you know i mean you know you, it, it's your moment as a coach but they 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 don't they don't want to listen to you that long and, and then they, i'm going to go back to my son again right so at this at this particular juncture, I was I was the um, technical director, the you know whatever you want to call it, director of coaching of McLean Youth Soccer, and I remember it because the day I was this happened, uh, Dick Cheney's um, uh, all the Secret Service people were there. It's right around Washington D.C., <clears throat> and I think his granddaughter <coughs> was playing on another field. And my son was playing a small sided game and I'm just sitting there enjoying watching it. And he walks off the field. I'm like, great job, Christian. Um, You could do this, this. And by the time I got to the third thing that he could be doing better, he just, he just stuck his fingers right in his ears. (laughs) I didn't know where to hide, (laughs) but it was perfect. You know, like I'm the, I'm the director of the club and I'm supposed to be setting the right example. (laughs) And, but they don't want to, I mean, so you have, you know, and then I'll, I'll bring up a story about Bruce. One of the best pieces of advice he ever, he ever gave me as a coach was it's easier to confuse players than to make them understand. And it's so true. And you only know that through experience because, you know, especially at the highest level, because you can really kind of screw things up for a player <laughs> with how you speak to them. So you have to be really concise and to the point. Uh, and it's the same thing with kids, you know, pro athletes, <clears throat> they have a short attention span, most of them. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a similar thing with, with children is that you, you kind of have to be concise and to the point and they don't want to sit around and listen to you talk the whole time. That's for sure. Yeah, it does. It does seem like Bruce is kind of getting better with age, if you want to call it that, but just his whole approach to it just seems to be He's incredible. He's, uh, improving every, every time yeah. he changes. He's like a, a very wise um, man. You know, he, he he's always, I've known him forever. So I've watched him evolve since I've been <clears throat> 17. I've known him since I've been 17 years old when I went to college. Mm-hmm. And he just always just gets a little better. He learns from mistakes and he learns from experience and, uh, he's very, very. His communication skills are, are. I mean, he's got a lot of impressive qualities as a coach. But that's that's one one strong point, one very strong strong point. We have a, a question from Ben D, and it's about the MLS youth coaches and the partnership with the French Federation. It said, do MLS youth <coughs> coaches still get training with the French Football Federation? And if so, how does that work? Um. So they did that a couple of years back where our coaches or they, they're not, not all of our coaches, but like they would pick one person from each club and they would go through this French, French course. And it was, re, you know, all the play, all the, all the people that I know that went through the course actually really got a lot out of it um, because there was a lot of, a lot of time spent, you know, in different parts of the world 
watching how things are being done. Uh, you know, over, over the last two years, I, I'm not I'm not sure that we're doing that, but we do have a, you know, the technical director of the youth stuff for for our um, our league is Fred Lipka, and so he's he kind of comes from that school. So some of his some of the things that he's passing on is 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 from that. But in terms of doing that uh, fr French football federation stuff, I don't believe we're currently doing it. Okay. It hasn't come up on my desk since I've been uh, working here, which has been one year, really, almost to the day. So you're not getting an all-expense paid trip to France to hang out? <laughs> no, hang out not at this point. <laughs> uh, next question that uh, came through was about the experience you have and how it transfers, because you have experience with working with youth players and collegiate players and professional players uh, and different levels of professional players. What are the skills that directly transfer from working with the kids to your role as a technical director with the revs? Well, I think with the the stuff with the kids, it, it really helps me with the academy, you know, and and it and um, you know because I, I know how to I I've been there, done that, and I know how to relate to them, so I know how to talk to the coaches that are working with the younger players. Uh, but I I just think all the experience, you know. You learn from it all, you know. You, you you figure out what your blind spots are, you know, the, your weaknesses, and and how you can, uh, you know, hire people that maybe complement you, and, um, you know, all those experiences, you know, you you know, you, you, it's th there's not a lot I haven't seen based on how long I've been doing this, mm -hmm. and so that always gives you confidence because. Um, you know, and the beauty of soccer is there's no one right one right way to do it. But when you have when you have a lot of experience, you you know, like I've seen a lot of players come through the system, so I kind of have a pretty good idea of what guy is going to make it. You know, um, so I think all those things you got to be, you know, you got to learn from your mistakes, and you got to be able to, you know, take those things to be able to hopefully make your system better. Um, and 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 I like managing people. There's a lot of that that goes on with what I'm doing. So I try to incorporate those things. What I've learned from how you manage people and motivate people, and when I've coached players and how to motivate them, and you know, um, so all those all those things are 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 done now a little bit differently in my role because you're you're kind of overseeing people as opposed to being on the field actually coaching the players. So you're coaching the coaches, you know. Not in the case mm -hmm. of Bruce, because I'm not coaching Bruce, but you know, <laughs> in terms of the, um, you know, our developmental system, uh, so that that part that, that that I really enjoy, and it's very similar. It just difference is you're managing kids versus managing the the adults. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> well. We have a another question coming in from Dan Rudolph, and I'm going to give him the option. It's like, Dan, would you like to unmute yourself and maybe ask him, ask Kurt the question sure. directly? Sure, any, I'd be happy to listen. I, I, I like it that way. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. You were just talking about motivation. I was wondering if you had some tips. Like, what are your best, what are your best tricks and methods for motivating players? Wow, it's hard to articulate it. I think, you know, for me, it's a lot of reading, you know, reading the players and and understanding the players. So I guess the best way, if I was to kind of break it down, um, you have to, for me, you have to have, you know, a relationship with the players. So you need to take the time to get to know the players, so that you kind of know what makes them tick, and based on that. You can, um, you know, you can find ways to to motivate and base. But the only way you can do it is if you got to know them. You got to get to know them. And I think what happens sometimes at the professional level, I think it and it may, and it happens at the youth level too. But I think sometimes coaches get they want to have their separation, you know, um, and that. You know, and that's fine. You need, you know, always need to like at the professional level, you always have to have that respect. But you also need to get to know him. And you know, David Beckham used to always talk about Ancelotti and how he was just 
such a great connect connector and he never raised his voice he was always calm but he always he was a relationship coach he knew the players and and based on that relationship he knew how to make him tick and at the end they wanted to run through a wall for him you know so that 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 part of that is is just developing those relationships and 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 getting the players to want to play for you so if you just tell them you got to play for me they're not going to do it you got to find they get you got to develop a relationship where they trust you it, and and then you got to feel it and then sometimes you know there's some guys you just got to you got to dig in and you got to be you know you, you may have to be nasty to get them motivated that's the only way they get they you can really get the most out of them and other players you got to build them up so everybody's different and obviously with the youth players you can't be you know, have, having these goes at the young players i mean that's you know we got to be you know at the youth level be teaching through positive reinforcement and all the through discovery and all that kind of stuff because that's how you stimulate the kids and i think that's how you motivate them too and they want to be encouraged um but at the at the professional level sometimes you you know you you got to find ways to you know to kind of get them going a little do you find that, that guiding players even at the professional level is there's still that value never goes away the, what was the last part of that? The, the, the guided approach with professional players, do you yeah. find that, that they still get intrigued by knowing the answers or getting, being Yeah, they all want to get better. To think? They, they all want to get better. Now, there's certain players that are, you know, they're, they're just, they're at the top of their profession and there honestly isn't a ton for them to learn, you know, but they want to they wanna win. Right, so they want to be part of something winning. So there, there's always there's always got to be ways for you to help them. Uh, and then it may be how do you get you know how do you get two players to work better together? How do you get them to believe in each other and work you know and those and those challenges uh, come about? But yeah, it's all it, it's all in, in important stuff. You got to you got to know who you're working with and what and, and what makes them tick. Do you ever have any of those players that are almost the personnel is just tell me what you want me to do? Yeah, and there are some. Yeah, like everybody's different. You want to try to, um, you know, you want to try to, you know, teach the, the players how to solve problems. So uh, if you have too many of those type of guys, you're going to have issues because inevitably the thing breaks down and you got to figure out things for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so but you know you, that, that there are cases where guys are like that for sure. We have a, another question coming in from Joe Privetera. Joe, do you want to unmute your your uh, mic and and ask Kurt the question directly? Hi, Kurt. Thanks for uh, answering my earlier question. I just want to know: Will the Revolution Development League continue for U12 players? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's a big part of uh, you know. And that's something was started before I was here, but I've heard a lot of great things about it and, and something that we're going to continue with. Cool. That's, yeah. Right, thanks. Yeah, because I was always wondering if that league continued, it seemed like a good opportunity for the Revs to kind of scout and ID players and then have them enter. Just their have relationships. And then, you know, like, you know, in time, everybody realizes, you know, like we're all competitors and sometimes there's, you know, you have the competition that goes on between clubs, but in, in the end, and that's all, that's human nature, that's fine. But in the end, if we're, if we're, if we're, if we're all doing this for the right reasons, we do it because we love it. And, and, and the, and then the, we're doing the right things for the kids, then, you know, the next kid's going to develop. All of a sudden a kid goes to the refs team. All right. Now it's an opportunity for, for somebody else to step up. It's like, it's the same thing here. You know, a player gets hurt. All of a sudden, you pull somebody else up. Now somebody else gets an opportunity with the second team, and all of a sudden, somebody you never thought was going to make it makes it, right? And there's there's plenty of those stories. It's just we get sometimes so you know uh, rigid with things, and we like, ah, oh, these are my guys, you know. And, and it, the more we you know we're able to to do that in, in a way that's uh, I think is it will be a better thing in the long run. So if you're always thinking about what's best for the kid. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Dan Rudolph has another question. Dan, you want to fire away? Uh, I think what I said uh, at the professional level, 
Is it more game-based and play-based and less technical work? Um, so right now, you know, like we just got, we, we just went through uh, individual, we, we were doing individual training because we could, we weren't able, you know, right now we're in group training and we're not yet into team training. So we've done a ton of technical work. Um, but typically a session would be at the, at the highest level for the Revolution Pro team, warm up uh, some technical type activity work, 20 minutes, possession type stuff, game related, you know, or functional. So that's kind of how it looks. We're at, as, at the younger age groups, you know, like in our academy, we're, we have a big emphasis on technical training. It's something we got to get better with. Um, so there's, it, it's a little bit more of an emphasis on technical training at the younger ages. But I have to say, like with the second team, we spend a lot of time actually after training working on technical stuff as well, just because you, you're, you're trying to define, you know, you're trying to help them refine their trade and get them to be able to be players that make MLS. So they, so we, there's, there's tech, you, you have to have great technique. You have to be able to control the ball. So um, even at the professional level, we do it, but in theory, they should have it before they get there in theory. Um, and, mo and, and, the, and the caliber of MLS now, they, they pretty much all do because the league has gotten so good. But at the, sec at the second team level, we still work a lot on technique. When you, when you said you did a lot of the work after practice, is that kind of volunteer, volunteering yeah, I mean, work just, for the players? You know, like I was, around? Yeah, I was just, you know, kind of talking about our time at, in the galaxy. And, you know, <clears throat> I mean, it's like these second team players. I mean, they, you, they're younger, right? So they, you can actually do more with them w without risking injury. So we would always um, break up two or three times a week at the end. You know, it's like we'd have a real focused plan on what we wanted to do with our team to get it ready to play. And then at the end, three days a week, we would break up into groups and guys would work uh, on specific things that were, that they needed to get better at. So if, Center backs were working on long balls, you know, uh, clearances, headers, um, you know, the attacking players are doing some extra finishing, that, those type of things. Um, technical work just to get them sharper, you know, and, and build up their deficiencies. Thank you for that. Yeah. We have a question from a high school varsity and JV coach. Uh, Grace, do you want to unmute yourself awesome. and, and ask her the question? Actually, um, I'm in my car right now. <laughs> okay, no problem. I'll ask the question. Um, Tra uh, travel safe. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So do your athletes focus on one position or do you encourage them to work, uh, work at varying positions? I mean, we try to, we try to profile them in some you know, like in theory, you know, profile what, you know, position they are and try to really teach them. Because if you look at a developmental system, we want them uh, to be able to pass and move and have all the technique. And they, we want them to have the p positional understanding when they get to the first team. So we try to, you know, um, do that. But having said that, inevitably, you know, what happens is, there's a whole bunch of strong players in one position and you have a really talented guy. And maybe because of that, you teach him to play a different position and, and, you know, good soccer players, they, they can play a lot of different positions. So that, you, you, you know, and they, and the smart ones can kind of adapt quickly. So there is some interchange from that. Um, and that's, you know, but I think in theory, we want to, you know, we want to teach our, our players to kind of have a function and, and, and get, you know, you know, if you're a central defender, you're learning how to be a central defender, but maybe you could also play right back depending on your size. Um, right back sometimes could play as holding midfielders. Um, wingers could play on either side, but we're, you know, we're developing the central midfielders, the center forward. So we're trying to profile it. It's never perfect because, you know, things happen and, you know, you have to be able to adapt. And sometimes when, when you adapt, you find out something new from a player that you never knew. Oh, wow, that guy actually does great in that spot, you know? So, 
we're not so rigid in our approach that we can't move from it, but we, we try to have some profiling. When did you realize you were a defender? Well, I started out the first time I ever made the national team program, I was an attacking midfielder, but I just kept getting pushed back each, each year I got older and older. You know, one time I thought I was going to play goalie, but um, I, I honestly, I did, you know, I started playing um, center back late in my career because I was always a midfielder, a holding midfielder, and then it just kept getting pushed back. And that was probably because of my profile and how I was big, you know? Yeah, but having those having those abilities of an attacking midfielder is not bad for a second. It helped defender. because you could, you know, you could, I had good, I had good feet. I could pass. Yep. So you were talking a little bit about identifying players or profiling players. Yeah. So can you walk us through a process of scouting or targeting players? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, um, obviously it, we try to, you know, we try to um, be very comprehensive of it. We have, you know, we have, we have, we, we have um, a director of scouting. We have a recruitment manager. We have an international scout. So we, we, we try to have a really good presence so that we know uh, the market as best we can. Um, but having said that, it comes down to needs. And so, and, you know, Bruce is very good at, because um, he's got so much experience at kind of forecasting what he's going to be needing. So based on what his needs are, and kind of what the budget is, we go and we go and look for a player, and and you know there's kind of that's our that's our process. Yep. So and then we have our staff look at it, and we make you know if it checks all the boxes, then we move forward. So what are those challenges on? Because you had mentioned international players, what are some of the challenges of bringing those international players, and at what age are you actually trying to bring them in? There's a lot of challenges because. Um, you know, there's 26 teams, and there's 26 teams that are looking for quite often similar player pool, right? So there's times we have a discovery process where we 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 identify players that we like, you know, and possibly could could need at a later date. We put them on a discovery list, but sometimes when we put them on that discovery list, another team in the league has already discovered them. So then, mm -hmm. in theory, we don't we can't get the player. So there's there's those kind of things that get in the way. Um, and then you just can't hodgepodge put a bunch of, you know, random people together. You gotta, you gotta kind of have a really good idea what the person's like, what, you know, does he have a family? Um, you know, what's he like, you know, how is he under pressure? Is he, does he have strong character? All these things, all, you know, you, you look at the full picture and see, and then you got to meet him, you got to watch him play, and then you got to look him in the face, and you got to you got to see how uh, that interaction is and that feel that you have because that's important. So there's there's a lot of things that go into it, and it's it's not an exact science. I mean, there's teams around the world that spend millions and millions of dollars on players, and they don't always get it right. There's just so many variables. You think about what could go wrong in a in a young a young person's life <laughs> that has to perform right. You know, things happen so, all the time. Are you more likely to bring in uh, an, a, an older experienced player and take a gamble on them or a younger player? It, it just, you know, I, I feel like the league is, is, is getting away from that a little bit more and there's, there's more of a younger trend coming. Um, but it's certainly having a player that's at a, at, a, at a good age, that isn't too old, that understands their role and how to play. I mean, those are... Those are, are great opportunities, but sometimes they cost too much. So, you know, it, 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 you're dealing with a lot of different things. You're dealing with, um, you know, cost, age, um, you know, needs of the player. Do, do we have enough international player slots to be able to, you know, to sign somebody? So those are, there's a lot of different things to think about as, as you're putting together a team. Yeah, it kind, of, it kind of overlaps to another question that came up, and it's about the transfer and salary caps for MLS compared to uh, many other countries. How are those, and I think you hinted towards yeah. it pretty much, but how do those challenges 
uh, come into play when you're looking to bring those international players in. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Like I said, the discovery thing become is is one challenge. Um, you know, where do you pick the players from? You know, I mean, you know, there's, you know, there's great players everywhere. So can, how do you how are you going to pick a team where everybody kind of you know comes comes together and becomes a team because that's a big part of it. Uh, and then, you know. <clears throat> We don't have an un there's there's not an unlimited budget. Although the league is is spending more and more money on players each each time, um, that the, the whole economic part, uh, you know, will affect who you can go after. Is that all part of the the budgeting and how you target players? It's like, well, this is what the uh, designated players are, and these are the targeted allocated money. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, all? you have. You know, it depends on you know, like the owner. What, you know, what the what your owner wants to do. You know, we currently have three designated players. That's a that's a real advantage. Um, if you if you have the right ones, um, you know. But but all the all those things play come into play and in how you you know and then you know how much money you have left on your on your cap and how much you know allocation money and all these different mechanisms for getting players. So it's a lot it's a lot to manage and. Um, you know, you, you you try to do the best you possibly can, so you can have the best best roster you possibly can under the circumstances with the amount of money you have. That's the hard right. part for fans on the outside to really get a good feel for things because it's it's really difficult to to see it from the outside to understand. You know, it's like, oh, why don't you get that guy? Well, you know. I mean, and it's changed so much because I remember I used to go to South America years ago and you'd be like, oh, I want that player. Well, you can't afford that player. Well, at least now we're, we're in situations we often can. Um, mm -hmm. But you still, there's there's situations where you can as well. So, you know, those, are, th those things be become challenging. And I think hard to understand from the outside, you know, where when you look at the European leagues and, um, they kind of, you know, some of the top teams, I and mean, they just, they, they have an enormous budget. Uh, one of the things that kind of goes back to what you were talking about before is how you're getting into the training, the first team and the second team, how they're training and what kind of training you're doing. And obviously everybody's where we're in the, the COVID crisis pandemic. Uh, how's that influencing or affecting the players and their behavior? You have international players, you have American players, are, are they expressing any concerns? We have such an amazing uh, group of guys. Um, so we have we have a group of players that want to play and are very grateful to be out training now. Um, having said that, I think you know through the whole process, um, I haven't I didn't see a lot of the players. Um, but I remember seeing Gustavo Bo because he lives close to me in, in Boston. And when I first saw him, like he was walking with the family, he was so funny, like, you know, the distance thing. And, and you could see that he was scared. You know, he was mm -hmm. legitimately scared. And I think it, um, you know, so, you know, there's cases where, where players are for sure. It's a, it's a, it's a scary time, you know, like, uh, um, you know, nobody really knew exactly, you know, um, you know, if, it just, it's just, it's, you know, like we all know, it's just a, a lot of scary things out there. And so certainly some players were affected by it by more than others, but I have to say they all <coughs> seen them all today. They're, 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 they're doing well. That's good. Doing well and, re and ready to, ready to get going. <laughs> I f you feel for them because I know that people that have families tend to focus a little bit more on them. People who don't. Yeah, I'm so, checking on my brothers and sisters and my nieces and nephews a lot more than they're checking in on me. But yeah. I know that they're also a little bit more concerned on, uh, you know, there's there's a lot more involved, a lot more people to keep an eye on. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And and you know, you, you know how it is. You just you hear so many conflicting things, you don't know what to quite believe. And so, um, but for them, I think. Yeah, I feel like they've come through it pretty well, and 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 get, everybody's ready to get going. Good for them. Well, we're looking forward to seeing them out on the field. Yeah.
So a question back to the revs and, and your technical director role with the revolution is, is this kind of a new role for you or have you held similar roles in the past? I have at a, at a, at a club, at a, at a youth club level, but never at the MLS level. I've always had these type of job offers and I've always um, turned them down uh, because I've, I've was always just focused on coaching, but I felt like this was a, a great opportunity to re, re, reunite with Bruce. Um, so yeah, it's different. It, it's, it's different than what I've done in the past, but uh, like I said, in a lot of ways, I'm, you know, from in the youth development part, I'm coaching the coaches, which is similar to coaching players. And but you're setting, you know, you're set, you're 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 setting the tone that Bruce Arena um, has set for the club. You know, and just in terms of striving for excellence all the way through the organization. So um, yeah, it is different, um, different set of challenges. But I have to say, I've really enjoyed it. And they have. You keep coming back to Bruce Arena, and I don't think everybody knows how many years you've spent with him, both as a player, college player, mm. professional player, and even in the coaching ranks. Um, it seems that he has been one of your mentors along the way. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about how he's how he's mentored you? Yeah. To be the the coach you are today. Sure. Um, you know it's. It's funny because my mom, you know, my my father passed away in um, November, so my mom lives with me here in Boston, and she's um, she has minor um, st minor stages of dementia, like mem short term memory. She can remember everything from long term, but just minor things. And she asks me every day, and she always tell she asks me every day, "How's Bruce doing?" When I come home from work, because she loves Bruce. But she's like, who would have thought? You always, you know, like you've always worked for him, you know, like, cause it's true. I've, you know, I've spent so much time with him. So um, I feel like it goes both ways. Um, you know, I feel very fortunate um, to, to, to work from him. He has been a mentor outside of my father. I just spoke about, he's been the most influential person, uh, you know, in terms of a mentor for me. Um, but he, he's just a, he's just a great leader. So, you know, I'm always, you know, I'm somebody that always wants to high achieve. So I, I wa I've watched closely on his, his, the way he leads and uh, the way he's fearless. He never, never is, you know, he's never in doubt. He's just very steadfast. And I think those things are, are, are good. But the thing that most people don't know about Bruce is that he's got enormous integrity. He's, he's a guy that's not going to cheat when you're playing golf. You know, like he, he's just a, he's a, He's a he's a man of high integrity, and I think you know when you're a leader, you have to, you know like a, a really good leader. That, that's a quality that um, it's really I think important because that kind of drives everything. Uh, so he's taught me that he's he's just always trying to achieve more. You know, he's just a driven driven guy. Um, so th those are just some of the things that you know I've learned from him. Work ethic, you know. Um, you know, but honestly, the list goes on. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, it's good that knowing that you have a mentor that becomes ends up becoming a friend. And yeah, it's absolutely a good relationship you have going there. I just had one more question for you. I was going to leave the last five minutes in case anybody had any final questions that they wanted to ask you. But you look back on your playing career and your as both as a youth player, college player, national team player, professional player, and, and the ranks you had as the coach. Um, if you could look back to when you were 17 years old and just getting into college or 21, 22, just getting out of college, if you could go back in time and, and give yourself a little, some advice, <laughs> what would that be? <laughs> well, <clears throat> yeah, it's funny, you know, because you look at, you, you kind of your life pass passing by. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of things I wouldn't want to tell myself because, you know, part of youth, you just freaking, you go for things. I always was always trying to ch achieve things that maybe were a little bit too lofty and I ended up achieving them. So I wouldn't want to change that. But I would say detail, um, devil's in the detail. Like, yeah, uh, 
you know, I'm a big picture guy and I've learned that the detail stuff, you know, like if you set your goals, you know, um, you, you need to, you need to work on the details to get there. Um, I would say I would, I would reiterate to my 17 to 22 year old self that you in this profession and what I just chose to do for a living, <laughs> you have to prove yourself every day. You, you it's like, it doesn't like, I mean, it literally doesn't matter. You could just have won a championship and then the next year you could be fired, uh, you know, halfway through the season. Cause it's just mm -hmm. a, it's just, it's an unforgiving business. So you got to prove yourself every day and you can, so you, you can never take things for granted. I would say that. Um, and then, you know, an old, like an old Irish guy gave me this advice. And that's what I'd want to tell myself earlier. So I was, um, at the time I lived in LA and I was living near the beach. I'd walk down to the beach at night and I kept seeing this, 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 this older gentleman. He was probably in his eighties. And at the time I was, you know, mid forties. And, um, you know, finally we always talk and he loved soccer and he loved Robbie Keane and he knew <laughs> what I did. And he, at the time I was assistant coach for, for the galaxy. And I, I asked him, I go, do you have any advice for, for a man, you know, half your age? And he said um, two things. He said, in your profession, follow your brain more than your heart. And it actually was spot on because I'm like, uh, I, de I definitely am one of those people that uh, gets very emotional with players. And there's times in this profession where you actually have to make really cold, hard decisions that are hard to make. You know, and you, your heart tells you no, but your brain says you got to do it. So I actually would, I think I would say that to myself. And then he said, don't be the richest man in the graveyard. And I, I would, I would agree with that too. So that was another, <laughs> another piece of advice. I wish I got a little earlier in life. <laughs> Probably would have made a lot, not the richest man in the graveyard one, but the one following your brain a little more than your heart in my profession probably would have helped me in some other jobs that I've had earlier. So those are things Sounds I would like say. Some good advice. We have it's a great a question, question, by the way. We're going to have uh, a question from Grace, who is the one who is driving, so I won't ask yeah. her to chime back in. But it says she coaches in a rural school, and she wants to know how she can help athletes improve their chances of getting noticed by MLS. Wow. Um, it's, a great, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. You need to get that exposure. Um, how how old are they? Do we know how old? High school. She's high a school. high school and JV coach. Yeah, I don't know if I have the the, the answer for her. Varsity. Oh, varsity. I mean, yeah. Obviously, the way to get noticed is to excel there. I mean, I mean, like, uh, I mean, things have changed because the the you know. In, you know, most of the players are playing academy now. The MLS league. Uh, I don't know what their stance is going to be necessarily be about college talk, but I would, I would just say that they just got to do the best they possibly can. And maybe if there's somebody that's really good that you really believe in, uh, I would, you, you, you just as a coach, you got to get to try to help the kid get noticed. You know, try to you pick up the phone and 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 call somebody to see if they can get a look. That, that's what I, I guess that would be my recommendation, but try to try to do the best they possibly can and stand out in that, in that particular team they're playing for. So we get a thumbs up for that. So thank yeah. you for that. Good. <laughs> um, and then final qu question before we wrap it up, cause it's almost eight 30 is from Rob. Um, he just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on the proposed format for Orlando. I mean, listen, I think it was a really creative idea. Uh, for, from the league to find a way to, um, you know, buy time in local markets and get soccer on the, on, you know, on TV so people can watch it. And hopefully we could, you know, make our fans happy, but who knows, maybe we could find some new, you know, generate some new fans as well. So I, I think, I think it's, I think it's fine. It's a, I think it's a, a smart solution under a difficult, difficult circumstances. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, just because it's a huge undertaking, uh, but mm -hmm. it's certainly going to be a you know a platform where 
where we can, uh, you know, play games and, you know, hopefully do well in those games and then set us up for the rest of the season. Thank you for that. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much for spending your time with us tonight. My pleasure. Um, it's a late night and you have a, a journey back to Boston, but yeah. thank you very much. It's very informative. And like yeah. everybody else, getting a chance to talk about soccer nonstop is probably at the top of a lot of people's list right now. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's fun. So my pleasure. I'm really happy that you guys had me on and thank you for everything you're doing for the state of Massachusetts and soccer and for all the coaches or whoever, whatever the roles are that are on the call. Um, thank you for your time and uh, support the revs. I know oh, you, I ahead. know you guys all do, but continue with it. <laughs> we have, we have, uh, we have awesome owners. I'll say that that have uh, supported us all the way through this unwavering. So we're, we're very grateful to them and we're, we're looking forward to having a great season. Well, thanks to everybody who joined in. We appreciate you spending another coaching conversation. Remember, tomorrow at 2.30, we have another coaching conversation, The Artful Dodger. We hope you could join us for that at 2.30 right here on bluejeans.com. Kurt, thank you very much, and good luck preparing for the upcoming season. Awesome. We'll see you guys. Take care. Yes, Bye. thank you very much. Yeah. See you. Safe. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Bye.